With me now is Rukmini Vajikumar from the Radha Kalpa Dance Company. She is here to talk about her traditional Indian dance performance this Saturday at the Reinhardt Music Center. Welcome, Rukmini. Hi. I was wondering if we could start by you t telling us a little bit about AIM for SIVA, the All India Movement for SIVA, this is, because your performance is a, a fundraiser for that. Yeah. Um, AIM for SIVA is actually an organization that supports uh, tribal children in remote areas in India. And what happens is that though there are government schools available in many areas, there isn't the facility for many of the children living in remote areas to actually get to the schools. So they came up with an idea where they have a housing system where the children can be sent there and they are housed. Um, they are given food, um, clothing, health care, and other sort of as well as vocational training. And they are sent to school from there. So beginning um, at an early age, like yeah. very young, like yeah. five or six. Or yeah. Wow. So as soon as they can go to school, um, they're sent there, and they're given all of the support so they can actually educate themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're also um, higher education institutions in some areas that they've started. So it's a um, it's a growing movement, and so that's why we're here. So it's a very worthwhile cause to support. So the, the program, the, the dance production that you have developed, the Nayani story, how did, what is that and how did it come to be a, a part of helping AIM for SIVA? Um, the story was, it, my mom writes short stories um, every now and then and this was something that she wrote. Um, a lot of the Indian mythology is used in our classical Indian dance traditions and often writers uh, who write um, contemporary times use the same characters but adhering to the traditional outlook innovate stories of their own which is sort of what my mom did and at that time when she showed me the story I, d I didn't actually think of using it in a production but um, about a year and a half or ago when I was approached with this uh, project to raise funds for Aim for Seva. I was looking through other things and, and then the story came up and um, after a couple months of thinking about it, I, it came to me. <laughs> I guess I, I saw it and I could see that I could choreograph and make it into something. So. Well, we have a video that I'd like to show, a little clip of the performance and then okay. I think that'll give people a good idea of what it's about. Okay. The colors and the sounds are just beautiful, and the the dancing, the the story that you've adapted from your mother's story. You also wrote the lyrics to accompany this as well. Yeah, um, I scripted it uh, from the short story. You have to script it for a production, and then um, I wrote the lyrics because uh, classical Indian dance uses a lot of lyrics um, during the production or when emoting 
there is a lot of lyrics in it. So yeah, I did write the lyrics in English. But uh, they are oh, so they are in English. So the audience will hear that in English or is no, that in Sanskrit? No, I got it translated to I Sanskrit. See. So the whole production is in Sanskrit. In actually. Sanskrit. And so the audience, they will understand it. How? Um, one is uh, the narrations or the conversations um, that act as narratives are in English. And the second thing is that gestures are universal. Mm -hmm. So um, if I go like this, it's what, mm -hmm. no matter where you are in the world. So gesturally, the, it transcends a regional perspective. So I think everybody so far um, as part of the tour has understood it. And so I think everybody should be able to understand this story. Well, and you're not out there by yourself. You have a, a troop who's with you and how, what kind of roles do each of those parts play? Um, it is an ensemble production. In classical Indian dance, um, we largely perform as a solo artist. So every dancer takes on different characters even within one piece. Um, so we keep switching our characters. And though this is an ensemble production and there's some recurring characters for each individual, we switch our characters. All of us become something or another. Um, and um, everybody's everything at some point. How is the Indian dance different from a dance that many Americans here in the United States are used to? What would you say, you know, makes it a different experience for the theater goer to watch this? Um, I would say there are many things on many levels, just from um, actually historical perspective, classical Indian dance is dated much older. So, I mean, ballet was 12th, 14th century, mm -hmm. perhaps, and um, much later it actually took its form, but classical Indian dance is, I don't know, 3,000 years old, mm -hmm. um, maybe older than that. and. The first written text, textual document as well is 3,000 years old. So the dance must have had some form. Truly ancient. Even before that. Yeah. And um, the classical forms are not just one. What we're presenting on stage is Bharatanatyam, but they're also Odissi, Manipuri, and there are several forms of classical Indian dance that are completely distinctly different from one another. Um, and it also has an inherent theatrical aspect mm -hmm. to it that sort of overlays. Um, so there's the pure dance and the Well, and that's one part. of the things I wanted to ask you about was how are those theatrical elements incorporated into into the dance? We talked a little bit yeah, about it with just the, the emotion that you need to get out to the um, audience. They're actually just mixed in. So there are parts where we dance and there are parts that we are expressive while dancing as well. So it sort of overlaps. So during this performance, do you feel like you are acting or are you dancing or what's the combination? I'm doing both. <laughs> <laughs> you have artistic talent. You started as a dancer, but you've also been doing some acting separate from what you do in this dance production. Can you tell us a little bit about the acting that you've been doing lately? Um, I've done some theater. Um, I'm in India, largely, and um, the last year and a half I, I toured a play within India called The Lady of Burma, uh, based on the Burmese Democrat Aung San Suu Kyi. Mm -hmm. Who was uh, just here in Fort Wayne, you yeah. might have heard. <laughs> and um, I've done a bunch of other theater and some Indian movies as well. Um, that must be an exciting departure. I mean, you it's very different from classical Indian <laughs> dancing. But <laughs> so, would you say at heart you're a dancer or an actor? I think I'm a, a dancer who acts when dancing. Oh. As well. <laughs> <laughs> so, where did you get your background as a as a dancer? Tell me about the interest. You know, when did you get your interest in dance, and how have you gotten to here with your training? Um, I started dancing really young. Uh, when I was really young, uh, I did ballet for like a lesson a year. And then we went to India and I started doing Bharatanatyam by the time I was six or seven. 
And is that something that many little girls do? A lot of girls yeah. do, but it's not. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's like you do it as a hobby, and then you continue after mm -hmm. a certain, like, ten years or fifteen years, and then it, there's a line from where you take it to be a profession. Um, so I did Bharatanatyam in India, and then I went to the Watson Conservatory, and I majored in ballet and modern. So that is sort of my background. So I, I guess I had both. So you've been here in the United States then for many years, when as well. But I, I went back after college because mm -hmm. I, I felt like I needed to do more Bharatanatyam. Your parents have been a big influence on you. I mean, not just your mother writing the story, but tell me a little bit about how they have influenced your choice in dance. Um, as many young Indian children, I was a nerd. And um, <laughs> <laughs> when I graduated high school, I, I got into Carnegie Mellon for computer oh. science and architecture. And I was 17, so my mom said, you can't go to college now. So you spend a year doing whatever you want, mm -hmm. but you have to be 18. So, so in that year, I started dancing a lot more. And my parents said, you know, this is an option. Uh -huh. uh, you don't have to become an engineer uh -huh. or a doctor, <laughs> <laughs> which is so common uh, for us. And um, I guess that was a, a big, like, OK, maybe I can do this as well. And after deferring twice, I applied to the conservatory. and. Well, from okay. seeing this, I think you have made an absolutely excellent choice. And people can see your performance tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. at, I'm sorry, Saturday night at the Reinhardt Music Center at IPFW, uh, 6 o'clock. Tickets are free. There's a number on the screen, though, that people should call for tickets. They should come. Can't wait to see. Yes, they definitely should come. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. I'm Melinda Haynes with the IPFW College of Visual and Performing Arts. On the next Arts Weekly, we'll learn more about what's on tap at two long-standing area arts organizations. We'll hear what's new and what's on the way at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art from Charles Shepard. Then Andrea Zwiebel and Teresa Galley will tell us about upcoming shows and events at the Honeywell Center in Wabash. For up-to-the-minute arts updates, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and be sure to join us here live next Thursday evening at 7.30 on PBS 39. The preceding program on PBS 39 was made possible in part by... Excellence lives here, here in Northeastern Indiana. It's reflected in more than 200 nationally recognized degrees. It drives our Division I sports. It's alive in our campus life. Excellence has a name, IPFW. Around our campus, around the country, around the world. Excellence lives here. Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne. When you